What does it mean to be blessed? Now, the Beatitudes are perhaps one of the better known portions of the Bible. They are found in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. But what's interesting is that Matthew's version is much better known. We'll take a look at why a bit in the video here. But this video is going to focus on Luke's version in Luke 6, 20 through 26, because that's the gospel reading from the lectionary for this sixth Sunday after Epiphany. We're also going to quickly look at Jeremiah 17 and Psalm 1 and see how they fit into Luke 6. Let's dive in. The lectionary reading for this week is in Luke 6, verses 17 through 26, but we're really going to focus on verses 20 through 26 here. But let me read the entire portion for you. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on the account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leave for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The first thing I want you to notice is that in Luke's account, Jesus is teaching this specifically to the disciples. Verse 20. This is not a message meant for everyone, but for those who have decided to follow Christ. And blessing needs to be understood in light of that relationship. This week's readings from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah 17 and Psalm 1, help us to understand the Beatitudes because they stand behind Jesus' thoughts here. So let's take a quick look at them. In the ancient world, there was nothing more important than securing the blessing of your God in your life. Everyone who lived during that time would have actively sought the blessing of their God to make them prosper, for protection, to have children, for healing from illness, protection from enemies, or for honor within their society. These blessings were seen as both intangible, you really couldn't measure or point them out specifically, and also tangible counting the number of children you had or your prosperity. To be blessed by God was to say that you were living an ideal life. To be cursed by God was the ultimate nightmare. Jeremiah chapter 17, the first two verses in the reading, verses 5 and 6, really explain this. In our culture, we speak about success or becoming a millionaire. In Jeremiah's day, they would have spoken about being blessed. Let's take a moment and look at the way Jeremiah metaphorically describes what it means to be blessed in verses 7 through 8 of chapter 17. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah metaphorically uses the image of a tree planted by water to explain what it means to be blessed by God. In desert environments, trees only grow where there is water, and this image brings across the idea mentioned above, that blessing is linked to our relationship to God, just as this tree needs to be next to its source of water. The tree is not just near the water, but it is actively sending their roots out into the stream. They are seeking out and trying to grow into the source of their life. This allows it to survive in heat, and it not only stays alive, but it's able to keep its leaves and continually bear fruit. It's a beautiful image for what our lives should be like as we live by the source of our life, sending out our roots into that stream. It allows us to live through tough times with healthy growth and giving fruit for others. 
It's not that we will have times of heat and drought, but we will have a source of water that allows us to thrive in them. And it will keep us from being anxious during those times of testing. Psalm 1 picks up this same image from Jeremiah. The NRSV opens Psalm 1 with, Happy are those. The Latin Vulgate translates the Hebrew as, Beatus virqui, blessed is the man who. Then in verse 3, the psalmist paraphrases Jeremiah. Then in verse 3, the psalmist paraphrases Jeremiah and describes what the blessed person is like. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. To be blessed in the Old Testament was a two-way street. First, they are blessed by God. They have won God's divine seal of approval for some reason upon their life. Second, it's because they trust in and obey God. They followed the Torah. They remembered the poor. They didn't seek their own happiness, but were interested in God and other people. They participated in what God was doing. We could say that their idea was outwardly oriented rather than our idea today, which is very self-absorbed or inwardly focused. And one final note being thrown in for free for all the geeks out there. In the Greek translation of Psalm 1, the translator used the Greek word makaros for the word blessed in this psalm. This is the same word that's going to get picked up and used in the New Testament to convey this idea. In the New Testament, makaros, or blessed, is used 50 times. 15 of those are found in the Beatitude passages in Matthew and Luke. While some translations have this as happiness or happy is the person who, what is surprising is that if the Greek authors had meant this, they had better words to use. One word would have been eudaimona, which translates as prosperity or happiness. However, this word is not used once in the New Testament. The other related Greek word within this semantic domain is hedone, pleasure. It's where we get the word hedonism from. This Greek word is only used five times in the New Testament and it's always used negatively. You can take a look at that in Luke 8.14 if you like. As we read Luke chapter 6, especially starting with verse 20, I want you to notice how grounded the Beatitudes are in the reality of rural peasant life in ancient Galilee. Blessed are you who are poor. Now the vast majority of people that Jesus would have ministered to within Galilee would have been poor peasants. They may have owned a small plot of land, or maybe a small business in a town or a village, or they would have worked on the estate of a larger landowner. But they would have been very poor, a lot like conditions in many of the developing nations of the world today. If they owned a small plot of land, it was probably not enough to sustain their family, so they needed to have another way to earn income as well. If they had a bad harvest for a year or two, they could have easily lost their land due to debt. Most lived hand to mouth. If they had any money saved up at all, it would have lasted them only for a few days or weeks, not like our retirement savings today. What is the blessing that Jesus offers? In the first beatitude, blessed are you who are poor, Jesus offers the kingdom of God. This is a very interesting start to the beatitudes. Someone in poverty possesses nothing. Their blessing is a share in the kingdom of God, a radical transformation in status from nothing to being heirs of the kingdom. Blessed are you who are hungry. This ties directly back into the first beatitude of those who are poor. What is the blessing that Jesus offers? They will be filled or fed. It meets their very basic existence needs. Imagine starving and being promised to be fed till you are satisfied. Blessed are you who weep. There's a lot of reasons why someone would cry or weep. Loss of a loved one, disappointment, betrayal, personal loss, illness. All of us could add items to that list that bring us to tears. But what is the blessing that Jesus pronounces here? You will laugh. Blessed are when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and defame you. Why? Because of the kingdom. 
I think we can all relate to experiences where people have alienated us or excluded us or defamed us. It's a very helpless situation. Within religious communities like first century Israel, this exclusion was often based on that person not living up to or being able to live up to the expectations of that community. Mary's pregnancy with Jesus would have been a great example. Lepers, drunk, sinners, any of these things would have caused that person to be excluded from wider society. Within the context of Luke's Gospel, the reason why these people are being excluded or defamed or reviled is because of their relationship with the Son of Man. And the reward or the blessing that is pronounced upon them is that they will have a reward in the kingdom of God. Present suffering will yield future rewards. I mentioned at the start that Matthew's version of the Beatitudes are much better known than Luke's. And I'm sure as we have been going through this, you've been like, huh? What? That's not how I remember the Beatitudes. So let's compare the more familiar version of Matthew's with Luke's. For example, Luke 6, 20 and 21 reads, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, 3 reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If we compare Luke 6, 21 with Matthew 5, 6, this Beatitude reads, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Matthew reads, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Luke's Beatitudes are very down-to-earth, concrete. Blessed are you who are poor. Matthew's version translates and spiritualizes it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The way I like to explain the difference between Matthew and Luke's account is that Luke's account is probably closer to the actual words that Jesus spoke on the Galilean countryside. Or we could say that Luke preserves the ipsa verba, the actual words that Jesus spoke. Matthew's gospel, though, has often been called the church manual because he takes Jesus' words and teachings but puts them and situates them or conveys them in a manner that they work in churches that he is leading and ministering in. We could say in that sense that Matthew is preserving the ipsa voce, the actual voice of Jesus. By adding poor in spirit, Matthew takes Jesus' teachings and following the spirit of his teachings, expands the application of the Beatitudes to a much wider audience, to everyone in the churches that he is ministering to. He shifts the focus more to an ethical or spiritual level. As such, they come across as the conditions or character traits of those who wish to inherit the blessings. There's one final point I want to bring out. After the four blessings, Luke includes four woes. Now these woes are parallel and they are the antithesis to the four blessings. This sets up a contrast between those who are poor and pressed down in this life and those who are rich and satisfied during this life. Once again, we see this upside down nature of God's kingdom coming through in Luke's account of the Beatitudes. Look at those who are blessed, the poor, the starving, those weeping, and those reviled and excluded. Compare that with those who are being warned. They are the rich, those who have enough to eat, those who are laughing and whom others speak well of. Compare these two lists of people with those that you're naturally drawn to. How about those that you have within your church? Or how about those that you put in positions of leadership? Immediately we recognize that those that we see as blessed are not those that God does. That our ideas of status, success, and privilege are just the opposite of God's. That what we think of being blessed by God is not biblical at all. N.T. Wright argues that when we model our ministry according to the Beatitudes is when real change takes place. Not when we try to institute some new holy Roman empire. It's when the church embodies and lives out the Beatitudes in community that people are attracted to the church and we have a lasting impact upon our communities and society. I would also add is that when we model our personal lives according to the Beatitudes, that transformation takes place. How do you see God calling you to put the Beatitudes into practice in your life? Is that an amen or an aw man? Until next week, peace. Peace.